What is the West? The West, I think, is the goal that Americans kept trying to reach and claim and never really quite succeeded. Ultimately, for Americans, they went so far west that they encountered the East, which was, I think, in its own way, always the goal. That goal, inherited from European forebears, was to stake a claim in the vast market that was the Far East, and in doing so, command the commerce of the world. Along the way, other peripheral goals, the occasional distractions, like the quest for religious and political freedom, gold and silver rushes, the spread of political and religious ideologies, nationalistic and imperial hegemony, or simply, as Lee Marvin so provocatively saying, in Paint Your Wagon, because some folks, well, were just born under a wandering star. The West is a romantic concept. It's grimy, it's raw, and it's splendid, and made ever so appealing by the fact that it's sometimes appalling. The West is a rapidly paced borderland, ever shifting frontier, not quite a line moving across the continent like the front of an advancing army, but rather a movement marked by leap -like, leapfrog-like thrusts by individuals, entrepreneurs, expeditions, armies, canoes, bateaux, keelboats, steamboats, sailing ships, ocean steamers, and railroads. The West was an intense place, offering an intense look at human behavior in all of its manifestations, an ideal laboratory in which we as archaeologists can turn to better understand who we really are. It's no wonder that the Wild West was the inspiration for Star Trek and at least one famous bar scene in Star Wars. <laughs> Perhaps fellow archaeologists and social scientists, the West, past, present, future, is where we truly are ourselves as humans. So, as an archaeologist, as a maritime archaeologist, how do I deal with this? As a maritime archaeologist, I see boundaries different, perhaps than those who have their feet on the ground. My work, like that of my colleagues, is based on the nature of the sea. It's a vast highway that connects globally all but isolated mountain and desert societies. It's a boundary that is the next section of the ocean. It's the next island, the next atoll, the next shore. It's as boundless as the Pacific, a third of this planet, and it is as focused as how we as humans have used that ocean to sustain life, to spread our culture and our ideas and our DNA, how we have used it as a frontier and how we have seen it as a peripheral zone from which various commodities were extracted and added to the mix in an emerging global economy over the last 500 years. For me specifically, where I keep coming back to despite wandering all over the world's oceans, is here to the West Coast and very specifically Gold Rush San Francisco. Why? Because I think San Francisco is one of the coolest places around, particularly when one looks at it in that transitional period from 1848 to 1853. The rapid rise of San Francisco between 1849 and 1856, actually more specifically, engaged the attention not just of us now, but in the time of the past, contemporary 19th century observers, subsequent historians were fascinated by this place, and in doing so, great in the In that period, San Francisco grew from a small village of a few hundred to a city of thousands. In that period, it also became the principal American port on the Pacific Ocean. How and why the city grew into this role has varied in interpretation. It has been mythic. Though all accounts note that the role of California's gold, the discovery of that gold, and the subsequent rush really were causative factors in making the city what it is. They're not quite right. But they were aware of one thing, and that was that they were really not in the frontier. San Francisco was never the frontier. It was part of this vast maritime highway. And in doing so, it linked to all sorts of trends that had been going on for a very long time. In 1854, local chronicler E.S. Capron summarized the contemporary view, though, of just what they were doing and how San Francisco had been created. And he noted with some pride in building the myth that previous to the year 1848, the wildest imagination could scarcely have conceived that as large and populous a city would suddenly arise under the flag of the Union, that on this remote and alien shore, or that the waters of this silent harbor would be whitened with the canvas of every nation and bold with the restless commerce of the world. 
But enterprise is not now the tardy nag it was 40 years ago. The sentiment perseventia vincia omnia, or excuse me, vincit omnia. Funny, you know, you have a couple beers before the plenary and you're laughing this. <laughs> but that phrase is not this day a merely literary flourish or theoretic idea, but it is a practical fact. And its truth has never been more signally illustrated than in the history of San Francisco, a history that has no parallel in the annals of the world. <laughs> Capron's assertion would simply state it suggests that San Francisco was an accidental city propelled into greatness by an enthusiastic international maritime capitalistic response to the discovery of gold in California, made all the more possible by those wonderful, rich, old white men. He's correct in part, but there was really nothing in here accidental in the rise of San Francisco or what was going on in the Pacific, nor again was it really truly a frontier, or a war, or a margin. San Francisco's gold, California's gold, wasn't an instigator, it was an accelerant. The remote and alien shore was not so. Connecting to a pre-existing Pacific and global system of maritime trade and commerce, San Francisco was not a frontier in any sense of the word or any traditional sense. It was part of an expanding, shifting maritime frontier that was, for me, the West, the Big West, the Wet West. What made it all work is the fact that the ocean is a highway, and San Francisco is a commerce field of no capitalistic expansion based on the concept of the entrepôt, or a zone free exchange. Though fueled by the economic energy of the gold rush, San Francisco had neither been identified as a potential entrepôt by capitalist interests in the early 19th century. Those interests focused on the domination of the Pacific trade, and in particular, the China trade. San Francisco's first historians, participants themselves in that process, felt that when the accident of gold or the accelerant of gold parked them there into a city officially established by Spain, but which had lain stagnant in their view until the arrival of America, capitalist interests, was now a chance to have bypassed the vast continent and from this edge now take the ocean and take the rest. And with that, as they noted at the time, again, you gotta love the language. Not only are Japan and China much nearer to the California coast than India is to England, but with the aid of steam, the time for accomplishing the distance is immensely reduced. So it was with the English in India, and so it may be with the Americans in China. Just give us time. England has not been very scrupulous in her stealthy progress over Hindustan, Salem, or Burma. They neither need fear of America, and neither should we, as Americans, fear her approaches if she, in like manner, conquer, annex, or take the Sandwich Islands, the islands of Japan, those of the Great Malayan Archipelago, or the mighty Flowery Empire itself. A few more years and a few millions of Americans in the Pacific may realize the gigantic scheme, the railway across or through the snowy Rocky Mountains, which will bind all of North America with the iron arm into one mighty empire, will facilitate the operation. And then San Francisco, the execution and triumph of that scheme will assuredly become what Liverpool or even London is to England and what New York is to the Middle and Eastern states of America, a grand depot for numerous manufacturers and products and a harbor for the fleets of every nation. Some frontier. What the gold rush did, what the rush brought, accelerated little better than 70 years of active work in this direction by, by the United States, by others. The gold rush provided more than just large amounts of gold, which was a requisite requirement for building up this town particularly after several disastrous fires. They provided a market and a startup for the new entrepôt as it served the needs of the miners and those who came for gold or to sell things to those who came for gold. San Francisco historian Jim Holliday notes how San Francisco's placement on the shores of the region's greatest harbor into a bay into which flowed two major rivers that penetrated deep into the surrounding country and its role as a landing place for the thousands of passengers and cargoes that made it the great commercial emporium of the Pacific. San Francisco by 1850 was a port secure in its monopoly by the luck of geography, assisted by the driving ambitions of its businessmen who worked to connect their port with the vast inland mining empire, mother to the city's prosperity. How did that all happen? It happened because the frontier 
was not the frontier again. It is part of a vast maritime network connecting the entire planet. The ocean has never been a barrier. What made it happen was ships sailing by the hundreds, arriving from around the globe. Thousands of vessels arrived in San Francisco during this period, discharging tens of thousands of passengers and in excess over half a million tons of cargo. A variety of global partners with commercial, not political interests, stake a better the trade. The focus of their efforts to create a successful unquote was quickly built a unique waterfront that utilized ships as floating buildings, wharves as streets, and buildings on pilots into which goods flowed from around the world. And on this waterfront, those goods were quickly sold or repackaged and transferred to the interior of California's vast hinterland and its gold mines. Now, a major fire destroyed most of this on May 4th, 1851, but the foundations for the successful port the Unco had been laid. San Francisco became an established link in the world's maritime trade and became America's New York of the Pacific. The success of all of this was described as a transformed place formerly a tented encampment, unapproached by any similar town in the West for size, and now substantial and ornamental and acknowledged metropolis of the West. That new city outpost of American ambitions of the Pacific not only had rapidly evolved, but in a way, nothing like traditional frontier process, at least as the historians have often described it, and which now we as archaeologists have challenged successfully, not only on the coast and in the water, but indeed all the way back across that continent, as we did be abroad. And I have to point out, use those rivers. The frontier process of play is not one that conforms to the model proposed by Turner, but waves of exploration, traveling and trading, farming and settlement by men of capital and enterprise who built villages that find their own to towns or cities. Neither is it conformed to Billington's later model, where it just modifies that sense of a slow and steady movement west. Isolated by the landmass of the continent, the mountain ranges, San Francisco is not linked to the rest of the United States. The gold rush, building on pre-existing patterns of maritime trade, suddenly powerfully connected not just the United States to its new Western acquisition, but it connected it to the rest of the world, into not only the United States, but to a growing global economy. Part of, in part, the national trend begun in this country in the 1780s to push into the Pacific to acquire new means for maritime trade sweeping up these commodities and using them again to capture the trade with China. By the 19th century, American commercial, military, and cultural interests were flooding into the Pacific and dominating the Pacific based its oceanic trades, and we still are living with the consequences of that. And so while I may focus on a specific city, the frontier for me is the ocean, and the ships that connect it to the rest of the Pacific and by extension the world. San Francisco is an artifact of the maritime system at play in the Pacific in the first half of the 19th century, and thanks to ships and shipping, San Francisco was tied to a web of international relationships and trade to become America's principal seaport in the Pacific and a participant in the global economy. And so for the last four decades, I periodically return to this touchstone to dig into the very waterfront, to explore a harbor now sealed by sand and covered by high rises which encapsulated like a Pompeii has tremendous artifacts that speak to it, as well as studying the shipwrecks that cluster around its shores and close to the Golden Gate. All of them in themselves, not individual sites, but part of a vaster landscape tied again to the big frontier, that is that ocean. Is this work bounded, marginalized, peripheral, central? I think in looking at it after these four decades, I think my work like that of my other colleagues is actually bounded by the bounty of Maine. I mean, in that I'm firmly set on the same deck as the majority of my maritime colleagues. And in that, maritime archaeology has moved from the particular focus of her beginnings and the quest for great ships, though I have to confess my great ship is still sort of cool and fun. But that's not what it's about. Like the mainstream of historical archaeology, I focus on looking at the larger systems and how various elements of a larger maritime cultural landscape relate to the theoretical underpinnings of our world. For me, simply I just get this. I'm basically a world systems person. And understanding how that ship is built is important, 
But where it came from, why it came, what it was carrying, and what trends, markets, or ambitions drove its voyage and voyages, that, for me, is the goal. And not just that ship, the waterfront, the port, the infrastructure, the marketplace, and in San Francisco, a city seven times destroyed by fire and coercion, always rebuilt, bigger and bolder, because it was that maritime Africa on the edge of the true frontier and was part of making the peripheral the Pacific part of the global market and dominating the trade of the Far East. Ultimately, I studied the archaeology not only of a burned over port and sunken ships, but the physical evidence that speaks to how they did it as evidenced by discarded and lost cargoes and burned ships buried in one. Thank you.